Hello everyone, I'm here with a very special guest, the meme god himself, former senator from Alaska, current 2020 presidential candidate, Senator Mike Gravel. Senator Gravel, thank you so much for coming on the program. Well, thank you for having me. I was just complimenting Senator Gravel before he came on about his Twitter game, and he tells me that this isn't actually him, which is a little bit disappointing, but nonetheless, whoever's running your Twitter, they're amazing. I just got to start by giving them the kudos there. Well, not only that, uh, they're articulating via their own intelligence and, and betting uh, the issues that we both agree on. So there's nothing at variance. It's just that you've got uh, younger persons, uh, certainly more enthusiastic and, and uh, more energy than I can muster at this point in my life. So it's good. It's good. <laughs> it is. I want to talk to you about that because this originally to run for president. I mean, this wasn't your idea. This is something that was brought to you by individuals who wanted you to run after they saw your performance in the 2008 debates. And for those of you who haven't seen this, I'm going to play a short clip of Senator Gravel basically railing against Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden. And this is the clip that initially got me on board because I was a little iffy at first. Like, who's this Mike Gravel guy? Watch this clip and then you're going to understand why there's so much hype around him. Senator Gravel, at a forum earlier this year, I want to get this right. You said it doesn't matter whether you are elected president or not. So then why are you here tonight? Shouldn't debates be for candidates who are in the race to win the race? Ryan. You're right, I made that statement, but that's before I had a chance to stand with them a couple, three times. It's like going into the Senate. You know, the first time you get there, you're all excited, my God, how did I ever get here? Then about six months later, you say, how the hell did the rest of them get here? <laughs> you know, and, and I gotta tell you, after standing up with them, some of these people frighten me. They frighten me. When, when you have mainline candidates that turn around and say that there's nothing off the table with respect to Iran, that's code for using nukes nuclear devices. I got to tell you, I'm president of the United States. There will be no preemptive wars with nuclear devices. To my mind, it's immoral and it's been immoral for the last 50 years as part of American foreign policy. Let's use a little moderator discretion here. Senator Gravel, that's a weighty charge. Who on this stage exactly tonight uh, 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 worries you uh, so much? Well, I would say the top tier ones. The top tier ones. They made statements. Oh, Joe, I'll include you too. You have a certain arrogance. You want to you wanna tell the Iraqis how to run their country. I got to tell you, we should just play get out. Just play get out. It's their country. They're asking us to leave, and we insist on staying there. And why not get out? What harm is it going to do? Oh, the, you hear the statement, well, my God, the soldiers will have died in vain. The entire deaths of Vietnam died in vain. And they're dying in vain right this very second. And you know what's worse than a soldier dying in vain? is more soldiers dying in vain. That's what's worse. Okay, so let me ask you this, Senator. What was it that made you agree to this? Because if I were in your shoes, if I were 88 years old, I if these kids came up to me and said, hey, let's run for president, I'd tell them, no way. So what made you believe that this was the right decision? When they called, and it was David Oaks that called and asked me if I'd run for president, and I said to David with a snicker, uh, David, do you realize how old I am? And uh, I'm 88, but I'll be 89. I'm, I'm 89. I'll be 89 next week, uh, next Tuesday, my birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, and so uh, what D David did, I, I was really not into it, but uh, David sent me a... Uh, a communication that included the list of issues that he was concerned with. Uh, and at the top of the list was the issue of creating a legislature of the people. So that's what I've been working on for the last 25, 30 years. And so when I saw that, uh, saw that at the top of his list, uh, I, I, he really got my attention at that point in time. And so now it became a question of how we're going to do this. And, uh, and so he asked if he could use, uh, have access to my Twitter. Well, I developed a Twitter in the 08 uh, presidential period and also Facebook. I never used them. Uh, I'm just not into uh, tw tweeting, as they say. And so I had no problem giving him access. It, it, it took a lot of activity, 
to be able to get them authorized to do this. But, but it was a question of my just trusting him and trusting his associate, Henry Williams. Uh, and, and there's nothing that they've done to cause me to question that decision that I made. Uh, in point of fact, I'm just so proud of the way it's done. They gave me originally uh, veto proof on anything that they were doing. I've only exercised it once, and that was, uh, well, twice. One was to not use the F word, uh, which obviously I use, I use privately, I don't, I, but, I, but I don't think it's a, it's a good public image for them or my, my campaign to have. The other was <clears throat> to limit the amount of negative on, on other candidates. Uh, we, we need to get our message across. We don't need to address the other messages. But, but it's a normal situation of critiquing uh, some of these other candidates when they go too far. And so I don't, I don't mind doing that. I don't really want them to do that, but, uh, but I think I can do it uh, and get away with it. Uh, because they can critique me if they want. There's, uh, there's no barrier to that at all. Sure. So that's how we, we, we got in. And what confirmed it with me was I had friends that would call me and say, God, Gravel, you're just doing a great job on Twitter. And I said, well, a great job is being done by these kids because they <laughs> understand the issues that, uh, that float my boat and they're exercising their judgment in amplifying those issues in an intelligent fashion. I can't tell you how fortunate I am. David Oaks is 17 years old. He's just wow. finishing high school and going to go on to Oxford. Uh, Henry Williams is a freshman in, uh, uh, at Columbia. And all the others are young. Plus, they, they admit to me that there are professionals that have contacted them and said, we want to help pro bono. And, and they admit that a lot of these professionals know a lot more about campaigning than they do. But by the end of this exercise, they'll be pretty sophisticated on campaigns uh, and as we go forward. Sure. So, how, it, let me ask it, you it was, this, it was Senator. The break, it was the break that, that we really needed because we need to bring attention to the empowerment of the people. Uh, I often use the comparison that what's the most important virtue that a person could possess? Well, most important one is courage. If you don't have courage, you won't have the tools to implement the other virtues that you may have. And so it's the same thing. What's, what's the most important thing in human governance? The law. The law. We all live under the law. And so we give a monopoly to representative government in lawmaking, uh, both in lawmaking and amending the Constitution. So if you're ever going to want to see a change, a fundamental change in representative government, you're going to have to become a lawmaker. And I have the whole procedure to bring that about with a constitutional amendment and with a, uh, a, a federal statute which is the, legis the legislative procedures to which the people will be empowered to act upon. So that, that's what floats my boat. I've been at it for 25, 30 years, and that's what the, the kids understood as to how to get me involved in running for president was to be able to exercise uh, a communications process to bring people's attention to that the answer is not just electing somebody to public office. The answer is to empowering themselves to make laws in partnership with their representatives. Right. And I, I certainly can get on board with that. But I want to ask you, where are you guys at? Because you need 65,000 individual donors to get you on the debate stage so you can put this agenda front and center. So where are you guys at approximately in that process? Well, all I can do is give you an approximation. Sure. Because I don't follow it on a daily basis. They do. And we're talking about, oh, probably maybe 25,000, 30,000 signatures. So we're probably halfway there. Okay. And, uh, and so what we've learned is that uh, we could, uh, uh, you know, uh, well, I, I, I lost my uh, the point. I had what you call a senior moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, so go ahead. what I want to ask you is I want to play devil's advocate here because on one hand, I do understand the need to take what you're saying to a national stage. But on the other hand, 
certainly in my lifetime, this is probably the best crop of presidential candidates because we have a number of really progressive people running who I support and admire, you know, Bernie Sanders, Tulsi Gabbard, Elizabeth Warren. So let me ask you this. What do you say if somebody says, well, Mike, I see what you're doing, but you're just taking time away from the candidates who actually want to be president. How do you respond to that objection? Very simply, because I have a better uh, concept of what needs to be done. Here, Tulsi Gabbard and Bernie, and to some degree Warren, <laughs> I endorse wholeheartedly. I donated to Bernie last last election, and I think that Tulsi has the, the finest gravitas and and the delivery of, of intellectual ideas of anybody I've ever heard of. But now, what is it that I bring to the table? I'm not sucking up their oxygen, because obviously, uh, I won't win any more than 20 some odd others will, won't win. They're not going anywhere. Mm. Uh, but so what's important is, let's say Bernie's got an agenda. Let me ask you a question. Do you think he's going to get his agenda enacted if the Democrats don't get a hold of the Senate? What's going to happen to his agenda? Yeah, it's not going to go anywhere. Absolutely. That's right. So, so if, so even if they got the, uh, Senate, when the last time the Democrats controlled the House and the Senate was when they passed Obamacare. At the time that it came out of the committee, uh, seventy percent of the Americans wanted the public uh, the uh, the public option. They never put it there. They made the judgment that well, oh, uh, we don't think we can sell that. That's crap. If you don't reach out, you'll never get it. And so what I'm advocating is that, that, that we, we elect the progressives, the most progressives to office, which would be Bernie and Tulsi in my mind, uh, and then we equip them with the ability to get their uh, agenda enacted into law. It's not going to be the Congress. It's going to have to be the American people who are going to be able to make laws. So if you ask the American people, uh, are you for single-payer health care? They'll win overwhelmingly. Mm -hmm. Are you for doing away with the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, what, what, let me, let me get some issues out that, that I would uh, to continue. Uh, uh, do you want to repeal the electoral college? You think that would pass by the people? Mm -hmm. And of course that would benefit cleaning up elections. Uh, then, uh, I want term limits for all federal judges, you know? So if we got a bunch of bad judges on the Supreme court, the sooner we can turn limit them, the sooner we can clean that up. Mm -hmm. And then you can go on to other issues, uh, like uh, the, the right. It should be in the Constitution, the right to health care, the right to education, the right to economic security. These should be in the Constitution of the United States. I've got a process to bring this about. And, and all it is, it's a, it's a constitutional amendment and a Legislative Procedures Act that is enacted by the people. The Congress will never enact this. The elites who control our society will fight this tooth and nail. Mm -hmm. But with the constitutional amendment that I have designed, we don't have to worry about them. So basically well, your goal is to get them to adopt this amendment that will empower the people. This reminds me of, I don't know if you've heard of Wolfpack. It's essentially a constitutional constitutional amendment to get money out of politics and their goal is to get two-thirds of state legislatures to sign on to this to get a constitutional convention and basically ban money from politics is this kind of similar to that in strategy hell no, hell no. with all with all due respect to these people it's a fool's errand if you're going to provide a if you're going to go to the trouble of getting a constitutional amendment mm -hmm. you better empower the people to be able to make other amendments mm -hmm. so if you do this one and of course what they're trying to do is to is to control money via law that's not going to happen you control this process by a constitutional amendment and that's what they failed to do and well, so that's we, what Wolfpack is about. They do want to ban it by constitution, like ban money in politics. Well, how, are they gonna get the, how are they going to get the constitutional amendment enacted? Well, with the two thirds of state legislatures, that's the strategy. That's, so I'm asking which, if that's your. What they're talking about is Article five. Yes. Which is a monopoly, which is a monopoly by representative government to deny the people to amend the constitution. So how would you so, go about getting a constitutional amendment? Oh, is what I'm trying simple. to get at. We, we get a group of people that uh, that accept the text of a constitutional amendment and they go out and raise several hundred million dollars 
and conduct a national election that will permit people to vote to empower themselves to make laws. And at the same time as they do that, they turn around and they equip the people with the Legislative Procedures Act so that just, just enacting the people to make laws without deliberative procedures is creating anarchy. And so this is where a lot of these people fall off the rails in, in not thinking through this whole process. And I don't say this with disrespect. Sure. Uh, I say this with the fact that I have 12 years of elective office. Uh, I am a history buff, and I've been at this for 30 years. But how this do you get them the to even get this on the ballot? Because we can't have a national referendum. Oh, so first do you go off, to states? But, but what do you say that again now? So how do you get your constitutional amendment because if you're saying that you want people to vote to give them the power well how do you do that because you can't do this federally so you have to go state by state so well, i'm just curious about the strategy you, well first off you got to not do it federal because if you did it within the government of representatives you're going to get sabotaged do you think for a minute the elites would would permit their uh, employees to go ahead and, and get involved in this without sabotaging it. We see this with initiative laws across the country. When we can't so, have a federal referendum is what I'm saying. So how do you, well, wait, how so, do you why do can't you, Wait, so why can't you have a, first off, it's not a referendum. Referendums are what government feeds to the people. What we're talking about is people taking the initiative. So you and I mm -hmm. and a few of our friends, we decide that we're going to be the group that's going to go out and create an opportunity for the people to vote on this subject. So what does that mean? That we've got to raise, a voting a national election is gonna cost millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. So we've got to raise a lot of money. But if there's people committed to this, that money will come forward. So now what we do is we take this proposal, a constitutional amendment and a legislative procedures act, an amendment and a law, and we put that before the people and we raise the money to be able to put it before the people. And we use the modern technology very simply. Do you want to be empowered to make laws like the people who hold a monopoly on that process today in representative government? That's a question to you. Yeah. Do you want to, do you, do you want? And of course you yeah. would vote yes because you're informed. Yeah. I would vote yes. Now we've got to get, we've got to get a standard. We've got to get at least 50% of the people plus one who voted in the last presidential election, we're talking to 70, 80 million people. And, and we can leave it, we can leave the, the election going on. So maybe a hundred million people want to vote to empower themselves to make laws. The minute we read the standard of what elects a president, we then declare this the law of the land. And I would like to see the politicians basically as a group, they're cowards. I'd like to see them go ahead and fight the people, 80% of the people who want to be empowered to make laws. It's, it's going to be Katie bar the door. Now, when you say <clears throat> that the elites will campaign against, of course they'll campaign against this, but they got to turn around and get the message across that you are too dumb to be able to make laws. Let, let, these, let these representatives that you don't know anything about manipulate you into voting for them. And so the only time you have power is on election day when you go into the booth and you click the switch. That's it. After that, you're stuck. All you got to do is beg, plea, and protest for the next two, four, and six years. And I, now, I like this idea of empowering people, but here's the problem that I have. How do you sell this to people within 30 seconds or a minute on a debate stage? Because it's, it's a relatively complex scheme to kind of just pull off. So... How do you condense that message and get to the debate and explain it to people so that way, one, they understand it, not just what it is, but also the strategy? How do you do that? Because this seems extremely complicated. Well, do you know something? Have you focused on the details of how you make laws in Congress? That's uh, very complicated. Yeah. That's all I've copied. That's exactly what I've copied in the Legislative Procedures Act, and I've tweaked it so it works for 100 million people. So if you're prepared to say, oh, this is too complicated, but then what you're doing right now is even more complicated and dysfunctional. Sure. So what you can say is, do, do, people, do people want to pay that much? No, they don't want to pay that much attention to it. But enough people hopefully will pay enough attention to it because you want to correct what's going on. You know that the government's dysfunctional right now. So what are you going to do? <laughs> Elect another body of people? 
that, that, that they act no differently than they've been acting for the last 100 years, 300 years? You know, stop and think. Science and, uh, has moved ahead from the discovery of the, the, at the beginning of the, kind of the Industrial Revolution. Science has moved ahead with discovery and change beyond our imaginations. Mm -hmm. What about the structure of government? It hasn't moved an inch beyond the, the, its founding in 1787. And, and what it was then was a device to perpetuate slavery and set up the device for genocide against the indigenous people of the continent. This is just the beginning. And so what you see, the, the murderous imperial society that we control today, no different than what it used to be. So what we need to do is to advance human governance to the level that we have scientific advancement. And, and we have to do that, otherwise we'll commit suicide. And that's because of the advance scientifically in the nuclear capability of planetary destruction. Right. And look, I'm on board with this idea. I know you're on board, but, but you wouldn't be talking to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, and I'm, I'm definitely interested, but I'm just trying to think about this in terms of how you really get that attention that you want. I mean, do you drop a web address and say, go to SenatorRavel.com? No, I, 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 I do what I'm doing right now. I'm talking to you. Right. You have influence within your footprint. But and on a debate that, stage, on that national stage, when the spotlight's on you and they say, Senator Gravel, explain this, are you going to say, well, look, here's just the quick rundown, but for more info, go to, you know, MikeGravel.com. Like, what I'm failing to grasp is, how do you sell this to people? I mean, the American people, for the most part, they're misinformed by propagandists, you know, corporate media. A lot of people think Judge Judy's on the Supreme Court. So how do you get something like this across to people in a very precise way when it's so difficult, when you're going to be up against other candidates, when the moderator is going to want to cut you off? How do you cut across that? How do you get this across? Well, real simple. First off, I'm under no delusions. I get into debates. I'll be lucky if I get six Five, five, six, seven minutes. Yeah. What, what oh, can you do in that period of time? Yeah. Do you think I can explain the whole legislative procedure, the way the Congress works? No. <laughs> of course not. So, so what you, do, what I, what I do is what I've been doing. I try to articulate it as best I can, so that people can be aware of it. So I can talk about issues like the nuclear suicide pact that our nation is on, mm -hmm. or how the suicide pact exists for the implosion of the planet as a result of the environmental problems that we're not addressing. So I can, I can talk to those and, and also point forward that, look at you're not happy the way things are going? Not you're no. being ruled by a minority, mm -hmm. okay? I'm talking about ruling by a majority of the people. Now, if you don't want to buy into that, that's your problem. All I can do is do the best I can, and that may not be adequate. It hasn't been adequate for the last 30 years, and it may not be for another 30 years. But it may be, maybe just right now, that the people are so fed up with the crap of, of what's going on in Washington and the government that maybe they would take a look over there and say, hey, maybe there's something to what Gravel is saying. So I don't know. All I can do is the best I can. Sure. But the communications responsibility is yours. I'll have a book out in midsummer. You take that book and you understand it. Read it through two or three times. Here, it took me 30 years to get this on the table, mm -hmm. and, and, and it would be the height of arrogance to think that you can read through what I've spent 30 years at, and you can understand it totally. Yeah. No, what you do is you go in and you ask questions, and if I'm still around, I'll be responding to those questions in great detail. What we need is to get this book, and the title says it all, Human Governance, the Failure of Representative Government, and a Solution quote, the people. There's only two venues for change. One is the government, which is dysfunctional and rules us by a minority of elites. And the other is the people. And the people don't have the power to make laws because that was categorically designed to not permit the people to make laws by the framers of the Constitution because they knew the people would not buy into slavery. And we have the example of what happened in Massachusetts to prove that. So, so since the founders got it wrong, and, and so it's, it really serves the elites who control us as a minority to, to lionize the, the founders that walk on water. They didn't walk on water. They were elites that provided for their own sustained power and the continuation of their power by, by their progeny.
that right. this is what, what 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 we have, and and I'm not denigrating them. I'm just saying they were human beings like we have human beings today. So and basically, that's not enough. We need and and it's to understand. This is where you can help understand what is the central power of government, any government. It's always it's the people. Law. No, no, it's the law. The people live under the law. So now the question becomes, who makes the law? Well, under the representative government, which is all we have in the world today, don't talk to the tyrants, forget them, just representative government. The people who make the law have a monopoly on making law. Those are the people you elect. And so the point I was making with you is that on election day, the only power you have is to give your power away. Mm -hmm. now, and so once it's gone, all you can do is write a letter to your congressman, the protest in the streets over what they're not doing right, uh, you know, go through the charade, or elect some more people to public office who are stuck into, see, it's not that we're electing bad people, or there's a lot of them, there's mm, enough. Of yeah, I'd say I'd probably it's, disagree it's with that. McConnell <laughs> and, and family, bad people, but uh, or Trump, bad people. But no, what what's going on is is that, that we, uh, here, I, I just got another senior moment, and I forgot the point I was making. Well, listen, I'll just, I'll say this, because I'm on board with it, and what I'm kind of grasping is that this is essentially to plant a seed to get people thinking about power structures differently, to get them to think about governance and really self-governance differently. And, and I can absolutely respect that. My the, the way that I'm thinking about this in terms of how you sell this is all about your debate strategy on that stage, because basically this is what your campaign is about. So let me shift gears a little bit here. So one of the things that I disagree with you with is your stance on 9-11 being an inside job. I actually don't want to talk about that because you actually had a well, pretty I lengthy... I do if you disagree. Well, no, no, no. Listen, you talked to David Pakman about this for about 17 minutes, and I think that Did basically... You hear it? I heard it. Yeah, I watched it. And I agree more with David Pakman than I do you, to be honest. However, let me say this. I don't care... Like you and that, that's not a deal breaker for me because what I want is for you to get your message and your platform across. Because I think if you have a robust platform, I don't care if you have these other views that I disagree with. But let me ask you this strategically speaking, you're going to be called on, and the first question that they're going to ask you, we both know it, it's going to be Senator Gravel. You've made some controversial remarks. You claim that you have no doubt that 9 11 is an inside job. How do you respond to that question on a debate stage? Real simple. I say, are you not aware of the fact that the commission that was created by Bush was first to be chaired by Henry Kissinger? Does that not give you an inkling that there was something going on? That he was he was acceptable because he's the classic cover your behind government. The second thing is going to be, does it not disturb you that the commission never even acknowledged the existence of Building 7 coming down by controlled demolition? Does that not raise a question? Does it not raise a question that this was the excuse that the neocons put forward to be able to, as they articulated in a letter, to be able to have a, a situation like the Pearl Harbor to energize the people to fight the war uh, on, against uh, terror? which is not a war, which is a war for infinity, does it not disturb you a little bit to wonder when you follow the money that the chief beneficiaries of 9-11 are the military industrial complex? Does that make you suspicious? But All Senator I'm asking for, wait a second, let me finish. All I'm asking for is that we have a new commission to look at this. We had three commissions look at the president with Kennedy assassination. What's so wrong? Sure, I say it's an inside job. I don't know who the insiders are. I'd like a commission to look at this again and maybe tell me who the insiders are. Well, this is what's so wrong with that? Why can't you accept that? another commission, not of politicians? I would insist that members of the commission, the last three president heads of the United Nations, should be on that commission, and scientists. Uh, and not politicians. We don't need any more politicians covering our backside. What we need is to going after the truth. And but right Senator, now, yes. The ahead. whole point in me asking you this hypothetical is to see how you would answer that question. And I think that you and I both know that the way that corporate media works is they don't want to give you the time to talk about your platform. So what I was hoping that you would do 
if that question came up, is completely dodge it, swat it away, and jump straight to your platform, not even get into it, because to me, it doesn't matter. Like, I don't care about that position. You know what I mean? Good so advice. Good advice. And I'll tell you what, when you see me in debates, I'll, I'll, I'll assert myself. With all due respect, that's not the question you should be asking me. Yeah, does that'd that be... Like, does absolutely. that sound like a good way to handle it? I think that would be fantastic, because this is the way that I... When I hear you talk about this, I think, okay, I disagree, but... I, it's not a, like I said, it's not a deal breaker. I don't care enough because your platform is what I care the most about. But the initial thing that worried me was that this is the one thing that we're going to take away from this debate. They're not going to let you get out the rest of your platform. They're not going to let you we'll talk see. about your agenda. Well, we'll, we'll see. We'll see how the debate goes. But if you got a taste of what the way the debate goes, just look at the last debate. Right. Which is why I'm also... I, I am right. confident. Yeah, well, what I'm living on, what I'm living on, and what the what our campaign is living on is what I said in the last last debate. And isn't it interesting that all of the problems that we had at the last debate before Obama got elected and now Trump, that nothing has changed? Yeah, does that does that give you a message as to have, let's have another election, get all these people elected to do all these things? They can't do these things. They, Obama wasn't able to do it. Trump is even worse. So what we what we need is a new device, a new structure that permits the issues that we want to be dealt with to be dealt with. That's what and I that's want you to say device. on the debate huh? stage. That's what I want you to say on the debate stage, regardless if they ask you about because they, they want to get like they want to draw you in. So you just talk about 9-11. You talk, but that's what I think would really be something that makes this a success is if you don't even you pretend as if you're the host of that debate and you just take charge and you talk about your platform. I think that is what I want to see. Is that what I did in 08? That's exactly <laughs> what you did in 08. So I just oh, want to make I, sure we I replicate that. You, I, I just want to confess to you I haven't changed. Good. <laughs> I haven't got a little older. A little, little, every so often I'll have some senior moments, but I think people will understand the senior moments Every, because they don't detract that. They don't detract from the message. We all have brain parts. What I was harking back uh, 11 years ago, uh, and I had a book, Citizen Power, and uh, and I'll have another book out that I can point to, and here is the blueprint to solve the problem. Good. And so we, your, your assessment is spot on, spot on. And and so you, you, you've got to understand that you have a venue of communication, mm -hmm. and you're using that venue. And now, by trying to get into what I'm talking about in human governance, that you're using that venue that I think it is a very positive way. So, so don't don't worry about the fact that well, how the people are going to get this. You just keep communicating. Absolutely. And, and the people that I've learned a long time ago, the people are not dumb, yeah, not yeah. at all. Not they're, at all. Very, they're very bright and knowledgeable. All they got to do is focus on the issue. And so it's so tough to make a living today and raise a family and all of that, that they don't have time to reflect. But, but now if you put things in front of them, they'll begin to reflect on it. Now, no question, we got 25% of the people that may be dumb as fence supposed I don't know, but the base <laughs> of Trump is there. But then you've got 75% of the people that are open open. Yeah, they, they're just misinformed a lot of the time by cable news, course, misinformation. The problem, is, wait, so the problem is mainstream media. Mm -hmm. Who owns mainstream media? <laughs> it's the yeah. military industrial complex. The, when they, and, and they sneak stuff in. They, they put forth some, pack, some facts that if you understand the dynamics of what's going on, you can use those facts against them. Uh, here, like right now, <clears throat> in the news today was uh, a Trump which is Bolton and, uh, and uh, the Secretary of State, Pompeo. Uh, a, a religious nut at best, uh, they're the ones that are making the case that we've got to, that Iran is a threat to us. Mm -hmm. Iran's not a threat to us, never has been. We're the ones that damaged them when we took out Mossadegh, when they had a representative government. So no, but why today we're moving the fleet in to threaten and scare uh, scared the leadership of Iran. Will they react? I hope not. When I was in Iran and was talking and made a couple of speeches and spoke to their intelligence community uh, elements of it, I said, hey, just be patient. You know, 
we're very immature in what we're doing uh, as global imperialists. Just be patient. And, you know, there's the old saying that uh, what can the powerful do whatever they want? What can the people who don't have power, they suffer what they have to. And so that's where we're stuck. We are the global imperialists. And whether it's Venezuela, whether it's Iran, uh, you name it. Uh, and, 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 of course, we use our sanctions. Sanctions are a tool of war. And so, and so right now, we are murdering thousands of young children who are being denied medicines and economic survivability uh, in Venezuela. When you come back, when you compare that to what China has done by moving 600 million people from poverty to middle class, and you then read the papers about, oh, the threat is coming from China, that's just crap. That's just crap. China is, is in my mind, performing a better service to the global economy than is the United States. Because we're misusing the power we have with the dollar. And I'll tell you, the dollar being the reserve currency is going to disappear. And because things are afoot to change that abuse of power that we have. And that's the foundation of how we can uh, sanction people, how we can uh, do things to them. And so once we don't have that power anymore, our sanctions won't be worth a thing. Right. Well, let me say this. The one thing that sold me on what you're doing is your debate performance in 2008. I actually feel bad that back in 2008, that was the first time I was old enough to vote. And for whatever reason, you weren't on my radar. Um, but I'm writing that wrong now. And second of all, the thing that I liked was your platform. The platform I said on my show is basically the gold standard. It's better than Bernie's. It's better than Tulsi's. It's better than Warren's. Your platform is phenomenal. So I don't want your platform to go away once this process is complete, once you go on the debate stage. So my one plea to you and your team is to put that platform online. Basically, if you can't get out what you need to, have people know that there's a resource. They can go to a website or a Twitter to see what you're talking about and what issues they're not being informed about. And with that being said, I will leave you with the last word to make your pitch to people as to why they should just chip in a buck to help you get on the debate stage. One, the, just go to the debates that occurred in 08. And if you like what I said then, you just like what I'm going to say at the new debates. Secondly, to your other question, is what happens after the debates? Oh, there's going to be a continue. First off, I'll have a book out there that right. only, only deals with uh, direct democracy. It doesn't right. deal with, like, citizen power deal, as was a polemic, plus uh, direct democracy. This is only going to deal with that, and it's not going to be any more than 80 pages. So you could read it in one sitting, and if you want to then reread it again, because it will take, you're absorbing the concept of what's involved. Sure. And so that opportunity. Now, secondly, here we got David and uh, Henry and what, they got uh, several hundred other supporters, including yourself, that you can now continue the battle, the campaign to educate the people. And so we will have uh, plans. I've got plans in my mind for these kids which have demonstrated their ability to organize and communicate. And that's what it takes to bring about a national election that will give you the opportunity to vote for a constitutional amendment and a legislative procedures act that will equip you to make laws to address the problems that you think are so important. All and right. I thank you for putting me on, and you've given me some good ideas. And I can assure you that uh, J David Oaks and, uh, and Henry will, will absorb them too. Uh, after the debates, they're going to be coming out here to visit with me, or, or I'll visit with them when I'm back east. But I don't intend to travel until it's to the debates. I'm keeping my powder dry. As, as what happened with William McKinley, who up until recently, you know, people went out and traveled. In the old days, you didn't. You sat at your front porch, and your minions went out there and sold you. <laughs> well, that's what's going on. I don't have a front porch, but I got a patio. So this is a hey. patio campaign, uh, and uh, David is the uh, David and Henry are the co-chairmen, and they're doing a fabulous job. I rely on their judgment. So you'll see us again, and you'll see them again because you're going to want to interview them. They've got the message just as well as I've got the message. I look forward to covering their congressional campaigns. Absolutely. 
Um, so I look forward to you dunking on the corporate Democrats on the debate stage, Mike. Thank you so much for coming on the program. Mike Gravel, tell us your website. MikeGravel.org, O-R-G. Don't get mixed up. I've got MikeGravel.us, but uh, this is the campaign uh, one, and just go to that one, and you can contribute a dollar. I need you to contribute a dollar, and that's not much to pay to get me on a debate. I'll, I'll, I'll entertain you that much. You get a dollar for a <laughs> me for sure. Okay. You you pay five dollars to rent a movie on Amazon. You could pay a dollar to watch Mike Gravel dunk on corporatists on a debate stage. Well said. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll leave that there. Thank you so much for coming Thank on. You. Thank you for having me.